So, um, after the discussion over the last hour, Still humming. Better? <laughs> we talked about master equations for the last hour, and, and I'm sure you're all absolutely aching to do master equation calculations. And, uh, uh, so uh, this is a, a code which allows you to, uh, to, to, to apply master, master equation to just about any sort of system. Um, it, um, it requires input from uh, uh, transition state theory calculations, uh, but it's, it's quite flexible. Um, and as we'll see, it can be used uh, to uh, analyze experimental data. Uh, so uh, it's called um, MESBA, which is Master Equation Solver for Multi-Energy Well Reactions. Uh, it's user-friendly object-oriented, open source, uh, and it it's, uh, it's re has been really very well def uh, um, designed. Uh, that's not a reflection on me at all. Um, and it offers users a range of options specified via keywords. So you c it's, on, it's on SourceForge, so you can access it very easily. Uh, it provides an interface with electronic structure calculations. So uh, if you're doing, um, say, a Gaussian calculation, you can inter interface the results of your Gaussian calculation easily to this MESMA code. Uh, output choices include chemically significant and, uh, and the IARE eigenvalues. You can look at them all. Species concentrations versus time. And uh, what we will call phenomenological rate constants increasingly as we go on. It allows uh, fitting to experimental data uh, using minimi minimization of chi-squared, so, so looking at the data, looking at a fit to the data, and looking at the differences between the fit and the experiment. Uh, and version 5.1 has just been re released in, at, at the end of April. So it's parallelized, uh, and it uh, allows also, as we'll see, fitting to ex even to experimental decay traces. Uh, if you want to use other methods, then there are two main other c codes. There's MultiWell, uh, which comes from John Barker's group, and that uses a totally different approach. It doesn't use an eigenvalue approach at all. It uses a stochastic method. Uh, and so there's a link to it. And then a code called MESS, uh, which is a matrix method, again, developed at Argonne by Georgievsky et al. And there's a reference to it, and there's a link. So, so those are three master equation codes that you can use for these sorts of calculations. So let's have a look at a couple of examples. Um, just to try to see, and these turn out to be, to have their complications because I want to show you some of, the, some of the problems that can arise. OK, so this is uh, an analysis of the reaction between H plus SO2. If you go to the 31st symposium, uh, there's a plenary lecture by Peter Glarborg uh, called Hidden Interactions, Trace Species Governing Combustion and Emissions. And one of the uh, topics that he discusses is sulfur chemistry. And ov obviously, sulfur chemistry is significant uh, because of the uh, emission, uh, particularly of SO2. And one of the reactions in, in Peter's mechanism is this reaction between H and SO2, uh, forming HOSO, uh, HOSO. And um, at the time, there were no uh, experimental measurements on this and no theoretical analysis of the reaction. And so the question is, how do we provide rate data for reactions of this sort? And are there any hidden complexities 
hidden interactions in this, uh, uh, which looks like a simple association reaction. Okay, so here's the potential energy surface, and it turns out to be a little bit more complicated than a simple association. So here's H plus SO2, and uh, there is an initial adduct HSO2, and then another adduct HOSO, and transition states going directly from HSO2 to HSO, H plus SO2 to HSO2, and also to HOSO. And then finally, we can get dissociation at much higher energies to form OH plus SO. Um, so the approach that was used was to try to do experiments uh, and to look at H using laser-induced fluorescence, uh, but you have to use vacuum ultraviolet laser-induced fluorescence, coupled with uh, um, pulse photolysis, and then using a master equation analysis, which hopefully we'd constrain to the experimental data, provided we could get enough experimental data. And so here's, here's a decay trace for H in the presence of SO2 uh, at relatively low temperatures. And so here's the rate constant um, as a function of pressure. So it's pressure dependent uh, at 295, 363, and 423K. Uh, and we couldn't follow the reaction beyond that. And so what we're looking at is this part of the potential energy surface. Now, um, what we then did was to uh, use potential energy surface for the reaction, these, this potential energy surface data, to do a master equation analysis. And uh, this is a sink, and we've got a source term, H plus SO2, an intermediate HSO2, an intermediate HOSO. So we've got three chemically significant eigenvalues. Oh, sorry. It, it, it's, it's multiple photon. Yeah. Well, no, it, it's a... It's, it's Could you repeat the question? Yeah, okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I, I'm learning, but very slowly. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a very old man, you know. It's <laughs> um, the question was, uh, how do you do vacuum ultraviolet LIF? <clears throat> and it's a single photon into the H. It's not, it's not multi-photon excitation of H, but you've got to do, obviously, uh, uh, frequency doubling plus. I mean, you, you've got to... Um, it, you, you, uh, uh, I think it, you put together three photons in the laser pulse in a... Uh, I think it's in xenon, in high-pressure high xenon. Does that sound feasible? Uh, <clears throat> And so, so it, it's not multi-photon on the H, but, it's, it's, but you're, uh, you, you do actually have a, a vacuum ultraviolet laser pulse, uh, but you've got to uh, uh, multiplex to get... You've got to add several photons together to get down there. Thanks for uh, the question. Um, OK. Uh, eigenvalues. There are three... Uh, chemically significant eigenvalues, and these are what they look like as a function of temperature. We were absolutely amazed when we got these results. Uh, but they're... Uh, so these are the eigenvalues that come out of the analysis. Uh, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3. And you can see here, this is the smallest of the relaxation eigenvalues. And you can see that at low temperatures, everything's fine. It's significantly bigger than these chemically significant eigenvalues. But as we go up in temperature, it begins to approach this higher eigenvalue, and there are problems here. Uh, we're not going to be able to get good rate constants at these higher temperatures. As it turns out, it doesn't matter in this case, but a later example will show that there, are, there can be problems. And so what we're measuring here is, uh, is related to these eigenvalues down here, lambda 3. And so that's the smallest IERE. OK, let's see. What, what we want to be able to do is to... We've got three eigenvalues. And we want to be able to decompose them in some way and out of them to get um, what we call phenomenological rate constants for the system. Uh, and uh, so there are three eigenvalues of smallest magnitude, and these are the reactions that are involved. Uh, 
uh, H plus SO2 going to HSO2, H plus SO2 going to HOSO, H plus SO2 going all the way to OH plus SO. And that means we're going all the way from here, skipping over these wells and forming OH plus SO. And that's called a well skipping reaction. And it turns out that they're very, very common. Uh, and then HSO2 and HOSO can interconvert, and HSO2 can go directly to OH plus SO, and HOSO can go directly to OH plus SO. So those are the phenomenal, th those are the reactions that comprise the system, and we want to get rate constants for them. And so, sorry, I missed a bracket out there. So what we can do is we can set up the chemical system. Uh, so these are the rate constants that are defining this system here. What I showed you before was uh, a very complicated shape for this uh, uh, lambda 3. Uh, if we go, go oops. So you know, why does it look like that? Can we understand it? And does it give us, give us any information? Okay, so, so sorry, this is, this is showing you for lambda 2, uh, which is related to the reaction H plus SO2 going through to HOSO. And uh, so at low temperatures down here, uh, here's lambda 2. It corresponds to K2 times K minus 1 over K1. So what that means is that we've got this system here at these, under these conditions is equilibrated uh, and the concentration of H plus SO2 depends upon that equilibrium constant. It's been reduced because it's forming HSO2 and some of that H, some of that uh, but H plus SO2 can then go on and form HOSO, but it's only doing it from the equilibrated mixture uh, coming from this first equilibrium. So that's what this first bit is here. And then the next bit in blue is K2SO2 plus K minus 2. So that's the forward and the reverse rate constants for this reaction here. So what's happening in this bit of it is these two are equilibrating. If you remember, that's the relaxation rate constant for going towards an equilibrium. Uh, and then this pink thing here is K minus 2. Uh, sorry, before that we get the green one, uh, which is uh, just K2 times SO2. Uh, but the, um, this K minus 2 uh, up here is telling us that this system is no longer equilibrating because the reverse reaction is much faster than the forward reaction because we've gone up in these high temperatures. So, so that's what this eigenvalue is telling us about this system. Oh, God. Sorry, I, I forgot to plug it in. <laughs> I am being a lot of trouble today. <laughs> um, okay, so, so that, exp that tells us about uh, the behavior of this eigenvalue. It doesn't necessarily tell us an awful lot about what's going on in all aspects of the reaction, but it does tell us about that particular eigenvalue and its behavior as a function of temperature at this particular pressure. Uh, and there's one of the rate constants that you can get out of it. That's actually K2 as a function of pressure. Uh, our experiments only really told us about TS1 and uh, about TS1. Uh, can we get information on TS2 and TS3? Uh, TS2 is significant in the range 400 to 800 K, but it's very slow. So uh, it's got uh, rate constants of the order of one second, the tenth of a second, in this rate range here. And that's far too slow to do our sort of experiments. You need a different sort of experiment to do it. 
Uh, and so maybe a flow reactor method would be a good way of looking at these experiments here. The uh, smallest eigenvalue relates to going from H plus SO2 out to OH plus SO. So can we get any information on that? It's even more difficult to investigate uh, in the forward direction. What we can do is use the reverse reaction, OH plus SO coming in and forming uh, 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 the, the products HSO2 and so on. And um, these are experiments which were done by Mark Blitz and reported uh, some years ago. Uh, and so we can analyze those and get information on transition state three. So, so that's the sort of background to all of this. Um, but there are some issues associated with it. Uh, one of them is the overlap of chemically significant eigenvalues with the energy relaxation eigenvalues overlapping with this one here. Now, at these temperatures, this eigenvalue is not important at all because H plus SO2 going to HSO2 has, has long ceased, since to, ceased to become important because HSO2 is just too short-lived. Uh, so in this case, it doesn't matter, but it's a, a salutary <coughs> tale that these problems can arise. So that's HSO2 going to H plus SO2. Uh, the use of OH plus SO to calculate forward rate constants using detail balance, does detail balance always apply? Well, we've just said that it doesn't necessarily apply absolutely directly, uh, absolutely accurately, uh, but it's not bad. Uh, it's a good approximation to use, and so you see the earlier discussion on that. And this is an important issue. I mean, a lot of you, uh, I know, use that reversibility to calculate your rate constants. Okay, that's enough about uh, H plus SO2. And um, what it showed us was something about eigenvalues. It showed us something about the complexity of these eigenvalues, but also showed us the relationship between the eigenvalues and the phenomenological rate constants for the various steps and how you can get them out of, out of the eigenvalues. Um, let's now turn to this problem, which is one pentile. So this is one pentile, and it can isomerize to form two pentiles. Uh, there is another uh, um, uh, pentile radical, three pentile, but we're not including it, that in this analysis. It's, it's, uh, it, experimentally, it's not going to be very important. Uh, and one pentile can dissociate to form C3H7 plus C2H4, and two pentile can dissociate to form C2H5 plus C3H6. And so these are the obvious reactions in that system. Uh, so one pentile going to two pentile, one pentile dissociating, two pentile dissociating. But then we can also get well-skipping reactions, where we go from one pentile across to form these products, or from two pentile across to form these products, without stopping in the intermediate wells. It's two wells, two CSEs, and so what you can do is you can set up the methodology we discussed on Monday uh, and solve it, and you get this for the eigenvalues from that purely chemical analysis, uh, and uh, where the KCs and KDs are defined down here. Uh, okay, um, so this is an exact solution of that two by two uh, Chem, purely chemical matrix. And if we solve the master equation, then providing everything is working properly, the chemically significant eigenvalues should correspond exactly to lambda 1 and lambda 2. Okay, so there's the chemical mechanism, and this is what we find when we do the calculations at 400k and at 600k. Uh, so, uh, the fastest rate constant, so this is as a function of pressure. So going from very low pressures up to quite high pressures. These, these are in tor. Uh, and the fastest rate constant is K7, which is the one going to the two. And then the next one is, uh, K, is K minus seven, which is the two going to the one. So those are the two isomerization reactions. 
The next fastest rate constant, interestingly, is the well skipping reaction going from here out to there. Okay? And it shows a very interesting behavior because it increases with pressure as we promote molecules up to higher and higher levels, but then it starts to decrease as the pressure increases because we're beginning to stabilize in this two pentyl well. Uh, so this well skipping reaction shows a more complex pressure dependence because there's a competition between dissociating over this two pentyl well and being stabilized into it. And then the others you can understand fairly straightforwardly. And similar behavior at 600K. Now, behavior at high temperatures, we begin to get overlap between the chemically significant eigenvalues and the internal energy relaxation eigenvalues. So these are the two eigenvalues, lambda 1 and lambda 2, the diamonds and the squares. And this is the smallest uh, internal energy relaxation eigenvalue. Uh, and you can see that they're becoming really very close together at temperatures of 1,000, 1,200 K. And those are the various rate constants down here, K7, K minus 7, K8, K9, K10, K11. Uh, let's try and understand what the, the eigenvalues lambda 1 and lambda 2 mean. Uh, we can, uh, we, we had the full solution before, and to a good approximation, lambda 1 is equal to K8 plus K10 over 1 plus K7, and K9 plus K11 over 1 plus K7 to the minus 1. Uh, now, uh, this is the equilibrium constant for this process here. And what this is saying, basically, is that uh, for the smallest eigenvalue, we've got uh, equivalent, we've got equilibration in these two wells here, and then they're dissociating by uh, reaction 8 and 10, uh, the direct dissociation in this direction, the well skipping reaction going over there, and similarly, for isomer 2. So this is saying we've got equilibrium concentrations of these two isomers and they're reacting in the ways that we would expect. If we do a binomial expansion for lambda 2, then what we find is that lambda 2 is given by K7 over K minus 7. So that's, if you remember, the relaxation rate constant for the equilibration process. So again, that's, that's logical. And Whoops. And that, we've looked at several approximations here, and at low temperatures, that approximation works really very well, but it begins to become less and less good as we go to higher and higher temperatures. So going from here to here is good at low temperatures, but not so good at higher temperatures. Now, uh, let's see what happens when we go uh, up in temperature. So this is 600 K. And this is uh, 1,000K. And what we're plotting here, and this comes directly out of the, out of the Mesmer code, uh, this is the concentration of uh, one pentyl and two pentyl. Um, and this is the total concentration of the two isomers. So we start off with one pentyl. It decreases. And here's two pentyl increasing. And they've roughly equilibrated at this point here. And then they dissociate to form the various products. And so here's lambda 1 and here's lambda Sorry, here's lambda 1 and here's lambda 2. If we go up in temperature, though, then these are the concentrations that we get from uh, the master equation. And these full lines are this, what, the, a simulation based on the rate constants that we get out of the master equation analysis. And they're clearly not agreeing. And they're not agreeing because of this overlap between the energy relaxation eigenvalues and the chemically significant eigenvalues. And so what it means is that under these circumstances, uh, we can't generate proper rate constants. 
and that we can't generate them because energy relaxation is occurring on the same time scale as the chemical reaction. If you remember, uh, the uh, energy relaxation gives us some, some steady state distribution from which we then react. In this case, we haven't reached that steady state distribution. We've got a problem uh, between energy relaxation and reaction occurring uh, at the same, on the same sorts of timescales. So 1,000 K, the bioexponential representation is inadequate. This is because of the overlap of IERE's and CSE's. The normal phenomenological rate constants can't be defined because of this overlap. So some conclusions. All wells can contribute to all sink channels irrespective of whether they're directly connected to the transition state that leads to, to a given set of products. Uh, so in other words, uh, the one pentile can skip the two pentile well to the transition state that leads it out to the direct products from two pentile. Well skipping is significant and is characterized by a non-standard fall-off curve which exhibits a decline in the rate con coefficient with increasing pressure, indicative of the competition between collisional relaxation and reaction. And um, for many, many systems that uh, we've looked at and other people have looked at, well skipping is a really important and significant process. And you just wouldn't expect it. The product yields are very sensitive to the difference in dissociation energies for one pentile and two pentile. The calculations give a very small difference. And so really you've got to do experiments in order to uh, get a valid uh, analysis of this system. At high temperatures, there's overlap between the CSEs and the IREs, so that time-dependent phenomenological rate constant cannot be determined. Now, here's a reference to Miller and Klippenstein. What they've done is they developed a species reduction approach that overcomes this overlap problem in some cases, but it doesn't overlap it in this, one pen, in this, in this pentile case. Um, what <coughs> so what we're saying then is that, that, that with this one pentile system, if, we've got, if we generate one pentile, then at temperatures above about 1,000 K, um, we can't provide... Uh, accurate rate constants for its dissociation and isomerization. Um, all is not lost because under these conditions, uh, if you, so supposing what you did was you generated one pentile uh, at a temperature of, of 1200K, uh, what can it do? Uh, well, it could react with O2 and form a proxy radical, uh, and that's what, what would happen at, at, under low temperature conditions. Or it can isomerize and dissociate. Uh, and what we're saying is that we can't provide good rate constants that allow us to look at that competition between isomerization and dissociation and um, uh, the reaction with O2. But under these conditions where this overlap is occurring at these higher temperatures, uh, the reaction with O2 is not significant because the dissociation isomerizations are so fast that O2 doesn't have, a uh, does, doesn't have a chance to compete. And so what you can do is you can simulate the, the dissociation and isomerization in, um, uh, in a master equation calculation. And simply, if you generate one pentile in, in your uh, system, what you can do is simply write down the yields of the products, yields of product one and yield of product two from the dissociate, from the master equation analysis. So that's the way you'd, you'd have to uh, um, uh, sort out this problem. But that isn't recognized in any of the models that currently exist. So it is an issue that does need sorting out in some way. OK, uh, half an hour to go. How are we doing?
anybody have any question? Or are you all brain dead? Okay. Let's now have a look at a, a problem uh, which shows really quite amazingly uh, <coughs> complex overlap between these various sorts of eigenvalues. Uh, so um, this is uh, work done in, in Tsinghua University um, <coughs> and published last year in PCCP, and it involves, forget about this thing down the bottom, but it involves uh, coranuline. So these, these are uh, soot simulation studies, uh, and coranuline is this uh, sort of massive ring system here, and what we're looking at is uh, an oxy radical of coranuline, and what's happening is it's isomerizing and then dissociating to form CO. So it's, so it's eliminating CO and generating this radical over here. Uh, it's a big molecule, much, much bigger than any of the molecules we've discussed so far. Uh, but many of you, is anybody working on soot chemistry? <laughs> no. <laughs> right. Quite a lot of people do work on soot chemistry, and, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about it on, on, on Friday. Uh, so uh, just let's look at the concentration fractions of these various species. So we're starting off, so F is the original oxy radical, and F5 is the isomerization, the isomerize, is the isomer of it. And so... Uh, these are different temperatures, uh, 1500K and 2000K, uh, and 2500K. And uh, so at 1500K, what happens is F decays away. There's a little bit of F5 produced, and F4, which is the products, rises up there. And so that's all quite nicely behaved. If we go to... Uh, uh, 2000 K, then F um, reacts quite rapidly by isomerization to form F5. And what's happened here is that F and F5, these two species here, are in, in equilibrium. So we've got an equilibrium between F and F5. And then that equilibrated mixture reacts away and generates the products here. Sorry, the product's here in red. And then finally, at higher temperatures, at 2500K, we get an even more rapid equilibration. There's more F5 present in the equilibrium system. And then they decay away and form the products up there. But notice these reactions are occurring on really very, very short timescales of the order of 10 to the minus 11 10 to the minus 10 seconds, and that's key. Uh, so the full curve in the PS shows the dissociation coronary radical F by the intermediate F5, 
Uh, the right-hand figure shows the time dependence of F, F5 and the product F4 calculated using MESMA. And the isomerization occurs on really very, very short time scale. Now, um, let's try and understand uh, this uh, set of curves over here. So what these are, are the eigenvalues, or minus the eigenvalues, that come out of the um, uh, master equation calculation. And this thing here is the collision frequency, or it, this is, uh, yeah, so, so that's basically the collision frequency there. And so the energy relaxation eigenvalues must be less, must be smaller in magnitude than the collision frequency. The fastest that uh, um, energy can be removed is on every collision. And uh, if you're going to transfer lots of energy, then uh, you won't be able to do that on every collision. It will be every few collisions. Uh, and so the fastest rate at which we can relax the energy is the collision frequency. But notice that what we've got are a lot of eigenvalues above it. Uh, with uh, magnitudes of the order of 10 to the 11, 10 to, getting on to 10 to the 12. And these are reactive, well, not reactive eigenvalues. These are eigenvalues corresponding to the isomerization from F to F5. <coughs> so that process is occurring much, much more rapidly than energy relaxation. Energy relaxation doesn't have a chance uh, because of the time scale of that process. Now, if we go back to this potential energy surface, that's, a, that's an activated process. Why does it occur so quickly? Why is it occurring on a time scale of uh, 10 picoseconds or something? Well, the reason lies in the size of this coranuline species. So it's a really big molecule. You have lots of densities of states. You have lots of densities of states, yeah. So, so you've got lots of vibrations. Uh, you've only got three rotations, but you've got lots and lots and lots and lots of vibrations. And so if you, so the densities of states as a function of energy are very, very large. And they get bigger and bigger and bigger as you go up in energy. And remember that the Boltzmann distribution goes as n over e, e to the minus e over kt. This term is decreasing as we go up in energy, but what does this thing look like? Well, it looks like this. So these are the densities of states as a function of energy for F and F5, and that's the Boltzmann distribution. And you can see that the distribution extends from 200 kilocalories per mole up to 400 kilocalories per mole. The isomerization activation barrier is somewhere way down here at only 47 uh, kilocalories per mole. And so in, in the, we, we, we generate this oxyradical. Uh, it's, it's got a Boltzmann distribution, and the molecules are, in the main, or almost exclusively, sitting above the energy needed to isomerize. And so it's going to occur really quickly. It's going to occur in the time scale of a single vibration. Uh, and so that's what's happening here. These are the eigenvalues associated with the isomerization of the different energy levels in this uh, Boltzmann distribution of coranuline. The, ener the different energy levels aren't communicating with one another uh, because you can't transfer energy from one to the other. You can't transfer the molecules from one energy state to another by collision because the collisions are too slow. And so all these different energy states are all reacting at slightly different rates but very, very fast and forming F5. So... Uh, so, so that's that Boltzmann distribution. These are the rate constants for the reactions, and these are the Boltzmann distributions at lower... Th these are the distributions uh, in F and F5 at lower pressures. 
So the left-hand figure shows the Boltzmann distribution for FNF5 at 2,500 K, and the threshold for isomerization is only 47 kilocalories per mole. Rate constants are consequently very high and exceed the collision frequency, and reaction occurs before any collision with a third body can occur. So each energy grain reacts independently of the others, and there's a wide range of reactive eigenvalues, most of which are larger than the eigen, than the IERES, until we go to really very high pressures. Although this is a, <coughs> a real problem uh, as far as the isomerization process is concerned, we can cope with that by simply assuming that when reaction occurs, those two are equilibrated. Uh, and this is the, the, the Miller and Klippenstein approach. We would just equilibrate those, those two species. But some of these problems persist when we go on to the dissociation step. So we've got equilibration between these two species, and then they've got to go over this barrier. But this barrier is still only 77 kcal per mole, uh, and much of this distribution is above it. So this also occurs quickly, although not quite as quickly as I see the isomerization. Uh, and so this shows us the concentration fraction uh, in uh, F4 and F5, F, 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 F and F5. So this is the equilibrated mixture of F and F5 at 1500 K, at 2000 K, and at 2500 K. And the important thing to recognize is, although it, it's not absolutely obvious to you, I'm sure, is that this is not exponential. Uh, this can't be described by a single exponential. It can't be described by a single rate constant. Uh, it's, these are exponentials here, and these are various attempts to fit to the, that, that, that decay. This one here is the smallest uh, eigenvalue. That would normally be, correspond to the rate constant for the reaction, but it doesn't in this case. And it occurs on a much lot, it corresponds to a much longer time scale than the reactions that are occurring over here. Uh, and so what, and, and these are attempts to fit the, the data, but what you can see is that the real system, there is a lot more reaction occurring at short times than is in this exponential process, and also it, it persists for longer times than in the simple exponential process. And so we can't simply easily use an ordinary rate constant to describe this process. And uh, what you have to do is uh, to try to see what the consequences of that would be in any sort of situations where you'd be dealing with this coronaline oxy radical. So the above figures show the loss of F and F5 in black and compare it to the smallest eigenvalue in red and two ways of fitting the decay in green and blue. At 1500K, they're all identical, and the CSE provides a good description of the decay, but at higher temperatures, that isn't the case. Uh, so a phenomenological rate constant that fully describes the reaction cannot be determined. Uh, the blue and green curves allow approximate rate constant to be determined, but their shortcomings must be recognized. And what you'll find, if you go and look at this paper, uh, then you'll find that... Uh, uh, the latter part of the paper is um, dedicated to try and understand the consequences of this inability to describe the system using ordinary rate constants. Uh, and work is still going on on these, on these systems uh, to try to see if there are ways of describing uh, the kinetics in a, in a reasonably accurate way. And uh, we'll come back to this problem on Friday when we, when we talk about soot. And here's a further example of IERE CSE overlap. So this is paper by, this is from that paper by uh, Stephen Klippenstein, and it refers to xylyl, decomposition of the xylyl radical, and they, they have found 20 wells in this system. It's a very compli complex process. And the black lines, as a function of temperature, show you the smallest 20 eigenvalues which correspond to the processes occurring from these various wells. And these blue ones up here 
show you the internal energy relaxation eigenvalues of the lowest few of them, and the red line is the uh, collision frequency, which is the upper limit for these collision relaxation eigenvalues. Uh, and so you can see that uh, for some of these processes, at higher temperatures especially, you begin to run into problems. Uh, and this is for uh, not unrelated reasons. Okay, um, just let me briefly introduce this part of the talk. We won't have time to finish it, uh, but let me introduce it and then we can discuss it again tomorrow. So, um, as I've said, our, our, our research group is, is primarily an experimental research group. And um, what we wanted to do was to use MESMA to understand our experiments. But also, it would be great if what we could do was um, fit the data uh, using MESMA. So use this master equation methodology to fit the experimental data in some way. Uh, and MESMA has a fitting facility that uses what's called the Marquet algorithm. Uh, I don't know if any of you have come across the Marquet algorithm. Uh, uh, and basically what you're doing is uh, if you've got, say, the rate constant versus pressure, then you have your experimental data, and there's your MESMA fit. And what you're doing is you're minimizing the squares of the deviations uh, from the fit. So you, you, you get a fit which minimizes the squares of the differences between the experimental and the uh, calculated rate constants. And the met method is often linked to electronic, electronic structure calculations uh, of the uh, PES with sensitive parameters such as a transition state allowed to float. So you, you select which parameters you would allow to float in this fitting process. Uh, and other parameters uh, include energy transfer. So we uh, always have this parameter alpha uh, um, as, a or we, we usually have this parameter alpha as a variable parameter. Uh, and, whoops, and Mesmer can cope with different experiments using different bath gases. So if you do experiments in argon, helium, nitrogen, you can fit them all together uh, using different alpha values for the different species. And it will return the best fit alpha values for those different species. A lot of the work that we do involves um, very small, uh, very fast reactions uh, and small activation barriers, uh, and often no activation barriers at all, radical-radical reactions. Um, and as we discussed earlier on, it's very, very difficult to calculate the rate constants for association reactions from ab initio calculations. You saw that uh, uh, the Harding uh, paper in which they showed the big differences, factors of 10, uh, depending upon the quality of the potential energy curve that you used. Uh, and we're not up to doing calculations of that sort of level. So what, what we want to be able to do is in some way to fit the data to give us those, uh, those, those parameters rather than get them from ab initio calculations. And we do this using a process called inverse Laplace transformation. Um, and so here's an expression for the high pressure limiting rate constant. Uh, and uh, so this is for a dissociation reaction. Uh, <coughs> and the rate constant at energy E multiplied by the numbers of states at energy E multiplied by the Boltzmann term divided by the partition function is equal to the high pressure limiting rate constant. And that's, that relationship is, is a Laplace relationship. And what you can do is you can invert 
that relation. You can invert that uh, relationship. And from K infinity, and a knowledge of the numbers of states, of the different energies, you can determine this dissociation rate constant, K of E. Uh, and so, so you can get that directly from K infinity. Uh, and the problem is that dissociation rate constants uh, vary very strongly with temperature. Uh, and it's very difficult to measure them over a wide range of temperatures. To do this properly, you really need an infinite range of temperatures, but you need a, as wide a range of temperatures as you can possibly get. And doing it from dissociation data is quite difficult, but what you can do is you can relate uh, the dissociation rate constant to the association rate constant, which varies quite slowly with temperature and can be measured over a very wide range. You can relate the two of them through the equilibrium constant. And so you can then do an inverse Laplace transformation of the association rate <coughs> constant. And the methodology is discussed in, in this paper here. Uh, these are sort of details of, of what you do. Uh, you parameterize the rate constant in terms of uh, a high pressure limiting uh, uh, a factor. Uh, this is one over beta. Is 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 this is one over kT? Sorry, this is beta is one over kT. So this is kT to the n. Uh, so this is uh, a, a temperature exponent, and then our activation energy. And this is for a plus b going to c. And then these are the relationships that you get by putting in that equilibrium constant there. And so so from these, what you can do in principle, is uh, to fit experimental data directly uh, with this estimate of, 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 of K of E. So, so what you'll be doing is you know the equilibrium constant and you'll be parameterizing the reaction in terms of the variable. Some of the, some of the variable parameters would be A, N, and the activation energy E here. Uh, and, and so that enables you then to overcome this problem of otherwise having to determine these very accurate uh, long-range potential energy curves. Okay, uh, we'll finish that off tomorrow. Uh, and uh, if anybody, <laughs> does anybody have any problems? <laughs> you just want to go home and die. <laughs> okay. Um, so tomorrow, what we'll do is we'll summarize some of these issues, uh, go over the fitting process, uh, and then we've got three uh, quite smallish topics to discuss. And so tomorrow should be an awful lot easier. Okay, see you then. <laughs>